Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight on, for this program on advancements in uh, treatment and screening for ovarian cancer. This is actually part of a double program that we're doing this year for Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. We'll be holding, um, directly after this, we'll be holding an Ovarian Cancer Survivor Celebration. So whether you're a survivor or a pre-vivor, just, you know, part of this group tonight, we, we'd love to uh, have you there and, and um, we'll be going as a group directly after this. Party, party. <laughs> I'm Stephanie Blockbar, I'm the Ovarian Cancer Program Director at SHARE, and this uh, big fan of partying over here is our Ovarian Cancer Helpline Manager. We also have our Program Manager, Maggie Nicholas Alexander, here tonight, and we're so glad to have Jane from FORCE. We're, we love working with FORCE, so we're really glad we're able to work with the FORCE group in New York again this year on this program. And I really want to thank Dr. Levine for coming to present this evening. This is the third year he's done this presentation with, for, for this group, and we really appreciate his time. Uh, for those of you that don't know Dr. Levine, he's a gynecologic oncologist. He's the head of gynecologic oncology here at NYU Langone. He's also the head of their research laboratory on uh, their gynecologic research laboratory. Um, so we're really appreciative of his time tonight. Thank you. Yeah, I'm actually saying interesting. Um, this works. Oh, it works perfectly. Great. All right, coffee, so we'll sleep. Um, so let's see what do we have tonight. Prevention and treatment of ovarian cancer. We've made a lot of progress on both uh, in both regards. And I'll try to uh, maybe talk for like 45 minutes and have plenty of time for questions and sticking around afterwards for things that aren't appropriate for formal questions, uh, but we'll talk about the origins of ovarian cancer, cancer genetics, prevention of ovarian cancer, and new treatment approaches. Uh, probably the first three things, eh, about 25% each. Um, let's see, oh, I got my little thing here. Let's see if this works. Almost. Almost. Okay, so ovarian cancers do not begin in the ovary. We learn, some of, I recognize a lot of familiar faces. Thank you for coming back again. So some of you may have heard some of this before. Um, some of you may have heard some of this on the on an OCRF, OCRA webinar from July. So some will be reviews, some will be new uh, and updates. But ovarian cancers do not begin in the ovary. They mostly begin in the fallopian tube. And that's the most common type called high-grade serous. And they also can grow out of something called endometriosis, which is a cause of infertility and a cause of pelvic pain when some parts of the lining of the uterus called the endometrium can settle in the pelvis or on the ovaries. That is very common, but it's not very common that that turns into cancer, and that's called clear cell carcinoma and endometrioid carcinoma of the ovary, which sounds like endometrium, which is inside the uterus because that's where the cells actually come from. So they all involve the ovary, and so we call them ovarian cancer, and we'll continue to call them ovarian cancer because otherwise it's too confusing um, for doctors and patients. Um, but but the, from like a biologic perspective, the actual cell where the cancer, you know, where the cell, the, the cancer cell first sort of lived when it was growing up is not actually the ovary, so we think. Um, and you can see that here. Um, so, the, so as I mentioned, they're not one disease. And I like to say, um, you know, these different types of ovarian cancer are as different as lung cancer and breast cancer. They're both right here, but no one's going to confuse them and think they're the same cancer. So ovarian cancers are all in the pelvis, but they really come from different organs, just like breast cancer and lung cancer. Um, and when we look at that, and I'm just looking to see if there's a stick, because these... Uh, pointers don't work, so we used to have a stick around here to point to things, but I can't find the stick, so I'll try my high power pointer. But um, the point basically is that a portion of, yeah, it's magic, a portion of ovarian cancer is inherited and comes from mutations in genes called BRCA1 and BRCA2, which you're probably familiar with. And we'll get into that a little more in a, in a minute. And there's a couple other genes that can also increase the risk of ovarian cancer, but only a few. And those are called RAD51C, RAD51D, and BRIP1. 
and there's a question about a gene called PALB2, and there's a lot of other genes that people are getting tested for nowadays um, that probably don't cause an increased risk of ovarian cancer. Some of them could cause an increased risk of breast cancer, and I'm not going to necessarily talk about that um, today. So ovarian cancer, you can see the, the, again, you can see here the cancers, high-grade serous, uh, endometrial clear cells. So most cancers are high-grade serous. This is certainly the most aggressive type, and people are probably familiar with that. Uh, endometrial and clear cells are, are also very serious cancers, but they are more likely confined in or near the ovary when they're diagnosed, so they're more likely to present at an earlier stage and therefore are a little easier to treat than a cancer that has left the ovary or pelvis at the time of diagnosis. And I'm just checking my time here, okay. So um, a big reminder is that all women with any type of ovarian cancer should have genetic testing for BRCA1 or 2 mutations. This is a blood test or a saliva sample. Um, and if you have a first degree, rel if you are a first degree relative, of someone with ovarian cancer and that person has not been tested for these genes, then as a first degree relative, which is a sister, daughter, or parent, mother, you should then be tested for these genes. But the better person to test is someone who has cancer and that can be very informative because if you have a mutation, anyone who's related to you by first degree relationships, like a mother, daughter, or a uh, uh, mother, daughter, or sister, um, has a 50% chance of carrying that mutation. That mutation increases your risk of, of ovarian cancer over the course of your lifetime between 20 and 40%. And we can do lots of things to prevent people from getting ovarian cancer if we know that they have an inherited mutation. Um, um, the blood t it's a blood test that's covered by insurance. Um, um, it, it, uh, the, uh, the other point, I'm sorry, the other, I lost my train of thought for a second. The other point was that if you have test, if you have cancer and you have testing and you don't have one of these mutations, the chance that any of your family members, you can come and feel free to come up here if you want, if it's more comfortable. If you don't have any of these mutations, your family is probably not at risk. And so it can do a lot to sort of um, help family members either not be worried about ovarian cancer or actually do something to prevent ever getting ovarian cancer. Um, and just to, to be clear, just a reminder, there's different types of mutations. The type of mutation I've just been talking about are called germline mutations because they are in every cell of your body and they are inherited. And the germline mutations are the ones that you can pass on. Um, and that's what we test for in a blood test. Somatic mutations are in the tumor. That's what people often think of when they say molecular testing or maybe genomic testing. So the inherited mutations, we often talk about genetic testing, and there is some overlap in the terms, but blood tests, saliva sample, you're testing for a mutation you most likely got from a family member, like a mother or a father. Don't forget that men can pass all these mutations on. Uh, men generally don't get these cancers, although nowadays we are uh, discovering relationships between BRCA1 and 2 mutations and pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, and male breast cancer. Those cancers are all more rare, and obviously there's different approaches to each of those cancers, and so uh, I'm not planning to talk about that too much, but we are, I'm obviously a G1 oncologist taking care of uh, gynecologic uh, cancers, and so uh, in, in this regard, men can pass all these genes down, but they're less likely as a as a gender to get the cancers that, that women get of breast and ovarian cancer. So again, germline mutations are, can be inherited and you can pass them down. Somatic mutations, they're just in their tumor. You can't catch them, you can't give them to anybody. They're just what created a cancer to become a cancer, but we can test for them now with different types of sequencing and other um, sort of molecular techniques that we'll talk about. And these BRCA mutations, they can be inherited or they can be just be local to the tumor. So they can be germline or they can be somatic. So if you didn't know these terms and you want to learn one thing tonight, it's the two terms of germline versus somatic. They're very important. Um, and so if you can't get to a facility like NYU, 
come up here if you want, over here. If you can't get to a facility like NYU, um, you can have genetic testing from your living room under a program called Magenta, which is a clinical trial that's run out of MD Anderson uh, in Texas. It's probably going to be closing uh, later this year. And basically, we're trying to figure out, is it as good to have genetic testing over the internet by a qualified company? We're working with a company called Color Genomics, um, and they do video counseling. They do telephone counseling, which has been shown to be as good. And we're trying to figure out, do you really need a telephone? genetic counselor or could you watch a video online and still you know get all the information that you need I want to clarify these are genetic testing companies for medical purposes There's a bunch of them I have no bias towards any of them I like many of them some I don't like quite as much but the ones that are common are myriad Ambry gene DX color genomics um, and there could be one or two others that I'm forgetting just out of lack of memory this is not to be confused with 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Those are com those are entertainment testing. Those are um, sort of uh, testing for fun. Um, I think there's another word I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting, but those are not genetic testing. Despite what you've read about 23andMe, it's not genetic testing for cancer risk. They're for entertainment purposes. They're for seeing if you're really European or African or Asian or whatever you want to do with that, and to you know maybe look at your risks of developing diseases, which is very uncertain and very inaccurate. Um, so those are entertainment testing. We do not recommend those. You obviously can do those from your living room, but that's not what we're talking about. You could do them for fun if you want. They're only $99 or whatever, but this is also, um, actually this, this study is free for people who are at somewhat increased risk, but a, a company like Color or Ambry, they all have uh, sort of um, remote genetic counseling, and it's real genetic testing. It goes to the same company that we send our samples here to all of those companies, and, and you can do that if you live in an area, and I just, for example, say North Dakota, where you might not have a genetic counselor within a reasonable distance. And so we now, and if you have family members, so if you have ovarian cancer, you have a mutation, or someone you know needs to be tested, they don't live in New York City, it can be done. Uh, so getting back to the fallopian tube, this is a little depiction from a paper we had in the Wall Street Journal about a year or two ago, just showing how the cancer cells kind of grow from the fallopian tube and they fall on top of the ovary. So the ovary is like, like, like a supermarket. It's got all the nutrients and all the food the cancer cells need um, to grow. And so the, so the cells fall on top of the ovary, so it's cancer on the ovary or cancer of the ovary. Uh, I'm sorry, it's cancer on the ovary, not cancer of the ovary. But the ovary is a great place for the cancers to grow. So, so the cancer needs the ovary. That's why we call it ovarian cancer. But if it comes from the fallopian tube, you know, that opens up a lot of very special opportunities for screening and prevention. Um, so how do we know that we're right? We don't know that we're right because we're not always right. We're pretty sure that we're right, but we're not always as smart as we think we are. But what we've done is we've taken these cells from the fallopian tube and also cells from the cancers, and we can look at their mutations. We look at a mutation called P53, which is in almost every high-grade serous ovarian cancer, and the exact mutation that, that, that we have over there um, is the same in the fallopian tube, the very earliest cancer cells. You can come up here if you want, plenty, you know, no need to make yourself comfortable. Um, pl pl uh, um, um, the exact mutation that's in the very early parts of the cancer, what we call a precursor lesion, is also in the tumor. And that's pretty good genetic evidence that this is the origin of the cancer. As well, if we take a, a tumor or a person who has cancer and we take the fallopian tumor look inside of it about 50 to 60 percent of the time we will see a very early precursor lesion in the fallopian tube we never see that in the ovary we can sort of tell where the cancer is beginning and it begins right from the fallopian tube um, and I can talk about later why it's not hundred percent it's only 50 or 60 percent um, so the fallopian tube is likely the site of origin for many or most high-grade serous carcinomas, probably not every single one, but most of them. Uh, ovarian cancer screening, which I didn't really talk about with ultrasound or measuring a CA-125 to see if someone has early ovarian cancer, has not really worked. Don't forget, screening means you're trying to find something. What are you trying to find? You're trying to find cancer. You're trying to find real cancer cells at an early stage. But it's still cancer. If you screen someone and find a cancer, that person still has cancer. Now, it's a much more curable cancer than if it was bigger or harder to treat. 
but you're screening for cancer. Prevention means we want someone to never ever get cancer. If we find the cancer early, that person's still probably getting chemotherapy. If you never get cancer, you're not getting chemotherapy and, and everything else. And so we want to prevent cancers, but would also like to screen cancers. We're really good at preventing cancers now in high-risk women who have BRCA mutations through birth control pills and risk-reducing surgery. We're really bad at detecting ovarian cancer early, and we're working really hard on that. I think last year I talked about a biosensor we're developing that's almost ready for human trials. I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but in my laboratory we do lots of research um, on both, um, on both uh, prevention um, and also precision medicine and other things. Um, so screening doesn't work. It's recommended against for the general population. So if you're not at high risk, which mostly means you have a mutation in your family, and you're just someone who says, I don't want to get ovarian cancer. I'm just going to have a sonogram maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. That's harmful. That person will end up in the operating room with an unnecessary operation. They'll more likely than not at some point develop a complication. And you do enough of these, someone's going to have a really bad complication who never needed anything in the first place. So we recommend against ovarian cancer for the average risk population. For the high risk population, the jury is out. So it's something to consider. I recommend it for many of my patients. For some people, we don't. We have a little discussion. So we don't know the answer in the high-risk population. Feel free to have a seat if you want, anywhere. Um, here. Um, but it's recommended against for the average risk population. In the high-risk population, so if you have a BRCA mutation, we recommend that around age 40 for BRCA1 and 45 for BRCA2, that we strongly recommend that women have their ovaries and fallopian tubes removed. That has dramatically reduced the chance to get an ovarian cancer. It also puts women into premature menopause, which is not great. So 30% of high-risk women do not follow our standard recommendation that used to be made by white men and now is made by lots of women and men together. But 30% you know, of people do not follow those recommendations, um, and that's a problem. So we need to come up with better screening and prevention approaches. Our professional society suggests that maybe we should just take out the fallopian tube. And if it comes from the fallopian tube and you take it out, that'll be great. The ovaries make hormones. That prevents menopause. The fallopian tube is simply a meeting place for eggs and sperm. So once you're done having kids, the fallopian tube is completely unnecessary. It doesn't serve any purpose except for allowing people to get pregnant. So if you're done having kids, you could take out the fallopian tube and essentially no one would be the wiser. Obviously, there's a small risk with those procedures, but that would be much better than having to take out the ovaries. However, this approach is completely unproven and untested. So, because of that, I just want to remind you, this is called bilateral salpingectomy. It's being done. I do it a lot, and we have a long discussion, but it's, it, it, it's a possible way to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer, but it's unproven and experimental today. So, this is the idea. In the United States, according to the CDC, women in their early 40s, recent, recent data 2015, 30% of women across this country in their early 40s have had their tubes tied or tubal sterilization, which is depicted over here. We cut the tubes, we tie them, we do lots of things to the tubes, and therefore the eggs and the sperm can't meet up, you can't get pregnant, and that's a contraceptive approach. But imagine if we just took out the fallopian tube then the fallopian tube wouldn't be there and it couldn't turn into cancer. Sounds great, we should do it. It might work, it might work really well. It might not work. Maybe the, maybe the early you know, cancer cell here has already you know, fallen onto the ovary. It's what I call the horses out of the barn. Maybe a normal fallopian tube cell is sitting on the ovary, which I call the supermarket, which is all the food and nutrients, and the normal cell will turn into cancer later on when it's already on the ovary. I don't know. I don't think that's going to happen a lot, but I have no idea. So the point is that while it sounds really nice that we should just take out the fallopian tubes and this will be a revolutionary approach, we don't know. So we have to test it, and it's really hard to do. So it's a really great idea, but it's unproven, and I think it probably will work. I think it's probably much better than not having the ovaries and fallopian tubes taken out. So just doing screening, which I told you doesn't work very well, taking out the fallopian tubes is probably much better than that, but still unproven. So, we have a study called the WISP study. It's open at these centers, including NYU. 
The WISP study is for women who don't want to have their ovaries and fallopian tubes out, and they just want to have their fallopian tubes out. And we're trying to see, you know, what does that do? Does it actually prevent menopause? Which it should. But until we can prove that we're actually correct and that women feel, you know, just as healthy and have no menopausal symptoms, you know, we need to demonstrate that. So this study has the primary objective of improving sexual function and menopausal symptoms compared to women who have their ovaries and fallopian tubes out. Again, it's run out of MD Anderson. We're one of 10 centers. It's probably going to close by the end of the year. And it's a very good proof of principle study, but it won't tell us if it actually prevents people from getting and or dying of ovarian cancer. And so we've been working for about 10 years on another study to figure out who would you study if you want to prove efficacy, which means it's effective and it actually works. Well, who would you study? You can't study everybody, because if you're 55 or 60 in menopause, you wouldn't take out just the fallopian tube because you'd want the ovary and fallopian tube to both come out because the ovaries aren't making as many hormones in menopause as they do before menopause. And when you do a study, you have to have two groups, and you want to show that one group gets less cancers than the other group. So who do you study? You study BRCA1 carriers, because BRCA1 carriers have about a 1% risk per year of getting ovarian cancer. If we study BRCA2 carriers, no one really gets cancer before the average age of menopause, which is about 51. There may be a couple cases here and there, which is why we recommend BRCA2 carriers to have ovaries and fallopian tubes taken out at about age 45, but we can't use that population in a study. So we have to study premenopausal BRCA1 carriers. And then how do we answer the question? Well, what's better than what? So we do something called a non-inferiority study. If we say, let's just take out the fallopian tubes, we want to make sure it's not worse than our standard of care. We don't need it to be better because the procedure is better. So we don't need it to work any better because taking out the ovaries and fallopian tubes works pretty well. We don't want it to be worse. That's called non-inferiority. So how do we design such a study? So we go back to a prospective study of a five or six uh, major cancer centers that pooled their data together. And when they were first figuring out, does taking out the ovaries and fallopian tubes prevent cancer, they had to ask that question and study it. And they found out the answer was yes. And how well did it work? Well, over the course of the study period, 99% of women who had a BRCA1 mutation and had their ovaries and fallopian tubes taken out did not get cancer. So 1% of pe people uh, got cancer. And so we're saying, well, if we can just take out the fallopian tubes and 98% of people will still not get cancer, that's pretty good. It's pretty good for, for us. Is it good for you? Well, that's a discussion. Is 1% versus 2% versus menopause? You know, but at least we can quantify it. So we're designing a study to say, is taking out just the fallopian tubes almost as good as just taking out the fallopian tubes and ovaries. And to do that, we have a, a, a study through our cooperative group, which has a long title here, but basically it's comparing the two arms. And since the title's very long, we need an acronym, so it's called SOROC. And so we have the SOROC study um, that's been approved by the National Cancer Institute, by the Division of Cancer Prevention. Uh, there's a <laughs> protocol that's undergoing sort of some tweaks and revisions, and we hope this study will be open next summer. And it's going to be open across this entire country, uh, Canada, Japan, Korea, Australia, um, some places in South America uh, to start with. And then we'll open it up to other places in Europe who are not part of this direct cooperative group, not that we're discriminating against Europe. We just have this group that in includes all those countries already. And so um, we're going to do that. Um, women will self-select salpingectomy or tubes and ovaries, so just the tubes or tubes and ovaries. We're going to follow them for up to 20 years. We're going to do different surveys to see, uh, uh, to measure medical decision making and estrogen deprivation symptoms. We're going to recommend that people who don't have their ovaries out have them out at the appropriate age, and we're going to see how people follow those recommendations. Uh, and it's going to take 10 years to accrue or collect or enroll 2,262 premenopausal BRCA1 carriers. So that's about 230 people a year across multiple countries. And then we follow them for a total of 16 years. So in 16 years, we'll know the answer. So that's a long time, but it's an important question. If we do better and we have Europe join us and we have 400 people per year, we'll get our answer maybe 10 years. But maybe 10 years from now, 
when I have a lot of gray hair, I'll be saying to someone, you know, you just need to have your fallopian tubes taken out, you won't go into menopause, and we're going to prevent your ovarian cancer, you know, and that would be great. Um, so, so we'll figure this out. Um, it's a question that has to be asked, and we hope that we can, we can figure that out. Uh, we think we can do it. I'm going to uh, skip some of this stuff because um, I'm getting long-winded. Um, so the, the um, take-home message is that um, ovarian cancer start in the fallopian tubes. We have mouse models to suggest this is correct. Uh, salpingectomy is, is a feasible idea. Um, it's unproven and experimental, so we're doing it with a proper you know, counseling. Uh, and this clinical trial will, will give us an answer at some point, um, at least in my children's lifetime. Uh, so moving on, um, I'll spend the rest of the next 20, 25 minutes talking about treatments. Um, and if you have any questions about prevention or screening, write them down, put them on your iPad, we'll answer them at the end, keep them in the back of your mind so you don't forget them, but we'll do all that stuff at the end. Uh, but now we'll talk about treating ovarian cancer in just one second. Okay, so the normal treatment of ovarian cancer is to do a big operation take out all the cancer that we can see with the naked eye, give chemotherapy, and have someone go into remission. The best scenario is when we can take out all the cancer, all the cancer we can see with the naked eye, people can get a full course of chemotherapy, and then we monitor them with CA125 that you're familiar with. This is the actual three-dimensional picture of the protein shown in two dimensions on the flat screen, but this is CA125, this is a CT scan. We monitor people, and too frequently the cancer comes back and then we give other treatments. Um, treatments work very well. We certainly can cure some people with advanced stage ovarian cancer, uh, but we certainly can treat all people with ovarian cancer. Our treatments are definitely getting better. People are definitely living longer. People are definitely living better than they were 5, 10, 20 years ago. I can't tell you for sure that we're curing a larger number of women so their cancer never ever comes back. We have a lot of studies asking that question, because to know that question, you have to have a lot of people who you follow for a long time. But the good news is we're really talking and studying 10-year survivors now. So the typical thing is, you know, the five-year survival rate is this and this and this. We don't care about that. We have a lot of people who are living to five years now. We have a number, too many people who are not, but we have a lot of people living to five years, but we're focusing on 10 years, and of course we want to focus on infinity years, but we really are, in our professional societies now, we only really talk about 10 years. We don't talk about five-year survivors anymore. We talk about 10-year survivors, and I have a lot of people living beyond 10 years, both with cancer and without cancer. And I'll tell you one study we did that was biased and sort of self-selected. We looked at people with advanced stage ovarian cancer who were alive at 10 years or more, and so it's not everyone, of course, but of the people who are alive, 10 years or more, um, about 40% of people had surgery, chemo, and nothing else. And about 20% of people had surgery, chemo, maybe one recurrence, and nothing else. And about 40% of people were on and off chemo for, for, for a long time. One of my good friends from Australia, we were just at a major ovarian cancer conference last weekend in Atlanta called the AACR Special Conference on Ovarian Cancer. Um, and, and, and me and my colleagues, um, when, I, when I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering before I moved to NYU three and a half years ago, we came up with a term called one and done, which means you get your initial treatment and that's it. And um, he came up with a couple other terms because everyone's cancer sort of behaves differently. So he came up with a term called grumbling disease. We're like, CA125 is kind of going up and down, and if this is you, you're in the doctor's office, you're like, oh my God, what's going on? And the doctor's like, oh, I don't really know what's going on. And you kind of, the doctor said, just wait, let's see what's going on. And you're like, well, I want to know, I want to know. But you just say, let's wait. And the cancer kind of just goes up. And down. That's probably your own immune system kind of responding to the cancer. And that's, that's not bad, you know, and that goes on for a long time. The other type is people who respond to platinum chemotherapy, which everyone gets initially multiple times. So for the plat platinum, we give platinum, cancer goes away, cancer comes back, we give more platinum. That's called uh, multiple platinum responses. And then the last group is, is sort of progressive platinum resistance, which is something obviously working very hard on where platinum works for a while, then platinum doesn't start to work. And so those are kind of like four models of ovarian cancer. Um, and, and that's sort of the basics. And so how do we improve upon the basics. Um, we're doing a lot of improvement and I'm going to show you some data that's been published in the past year, presented at national meetings over the past year that sort of takes various drugs and makes them work better. And so maybe I'll just go back for a second. Before I talk about the data, I'll just make a comment about clinical trials. And so clinical trials are great. 
and they're great for patients, um, except for what we, what we call like the first in human trial. This is the trial like people come in the office, and I, I sort of hate to use this term, but they're like, I don't want to be a guinea pig. So first in human, when you're taking a brand new drug, that's, the, you know, I'm, I don't want to like equate humans to guinea pigs. I think that's insulting and all sorts of things. But the first in human trial, it's probably not going to work. And that's really a trial. I have nothing else. I'm going to try this just for the heck of it. And it may be right. It may be wrong. It may be good for some people. It is how we develop drugs. And all these drugs that people are getting were at that point someday. So people might want to do it to help the future, et cetera. That's not a lot of our clinical trials. It's almost none of them. Most clinical trials nowadays take the standard treatment that is a very reasonable treatment that, you, that someone would probably get anyway and adds another drug to see if it works better. And so the opportunity is you're going to get the next best drug, we know how it works, and you're going to get a treatment that's going to be better than what the standard would be. That's great. What's the risk? You add another drug, you add a little toxicity. And so there may be a little toxicity. We may not fully know all the toxicity when we combine drugs together. And we may find out the additional drug doesn't help. So then you've got the toxicity without any benefit. So that's the balance. So clinical trials are great because they're very well regulated. Um, there's a very strict sort of recipe that we follow. Um, and there's an opportunity to get something that works better. And the cost is there may be more toxicity. It may not be a big deal. It may be you know, a little more fatigue, or it could be something that's, you know, a big deal. And we think we know what those toxicities are, but since it is a clinical trial, again, we're not always as smart as we think we are, and so, you know, we have an idea. Very few trials sort of get closed for safety. Um, a, n a number of them get closed for not working. But clinical trials, those type of clinical trials are really what most of us talk about when we say, you know, you really should go on a clinical trial. It's a great opportunity. The other thing clinical trials do, it gets you access to a drug that we might like to give to you that we can't give to you because it's not commercially available. And so that's the other benefit of clinical trials. So clinical trials are great. We have um, 24 or 25 gynecologic oncology clinical trials open here at NYU. We have for a 12 trials for ovarian cancer, and we have more phase three trials open here than any other medical center in the tri-state area. Um, so what have clinical trials taught us? Um, this is a clinical trial for a rare type of ovarian cancer called carcinosarcoma. It is a fairly aggressive subtype. It also develops in the uterus. Um, and so the question was, we used to give a very toxic regimen called ifosfamide and taxol. We'd like to give carbo and taxol, which is much less toxic, which is commonly given for regular ovarian cancer. Is that just as good? And so they um, compared those two arms, and they actually enrolled 600 people, which we thought we never could do for sort of a rare tumor. They compared uh, the two treatments, and they basically found out that they're the same. So that's good. So again, this was called a non-inferiority trial because we already had a standard. So we're not looking for something that was better. We're looking for something that was the same but less toxic. There's another type of clinical trial. You know, we don't want things to be better. We want them to be, well, they're better, but we want them to be better from a quality of life perspective. It would be, and in fact, there was a suggestion that it also worked better, which was not the purpose of the trial, but it's not a bad thing when the treatment works better. Um, and so this is now our standard for these rare aggressive types called carcinosarcomas. Um, this was an interesting trial. So I told you that, you know, the goal of, and I should take a step back, the, the, the standard treatment is a big operation followed by chemotherapy to take out all the cancer when we can do that. So there's two main situations where we cannot do that. One is if someone is not physically fit to tolerate a big operation. These operations, as some of you know, if you've had them, can easily be six hours. I've done many 10-hour operations, a couple of 12 to 14 hours. It's a big deal. That's like running a marathon. So I can run a 5K. I cannot run a marathon. But if you put my body through a marathon, I'd probably make it, I think. But if, you know, if you're, you know, maybe, you know, have, you know, history of heart disease or something else, you know, a big operation can be very dangerous. And so there are some people who have poorly controlled diabetes, uh, maybe some heart problems. They can't tolerate a six to 10 hour operation. So that would be dangerous. And the other type of times when we don't do the operation is if there's cancer we can't take out. 
So that's operator dependent. I can do some things other people can't do. Maybe there's someone who could do something I can't do. I have friends who help me with things I can't do um, that I'm not trained to do. Um, but there are still things that, that, we, that are just un, unreasonable. We can't take out a lot of ovarian cancer from the chest. You know, there are certain times we can look inside someone and find out that the intestines are too involved to, to remove. We can't take out all the intestines because we just can't do that even though we technically know how to do that. It's not you know, the right thing to do. So if a cancer is too advanced, we also can't do an initial operation and that's when we give chemotherapy. So when we give chemotherapy first, that's called neoadjuvant chemotherapy. We give a couple cycles of chemotherapy, the cancer gets smaller, we then do an operation and give more chemotherapy. So the question here is in older women who what they call are vulnerable, which means they have some characteristics that make us concerned about whether they can tolerate a big operation and get back to all of their normal activities, you know, should they have an operation at all or should they just get chemotherapy and what kind of chemotherapy should that be? And so these are some of the things we look at. We look at activities of daily living. Can you go to the store? Can you dress yourself, bathe yourself? Can you, you know, sort of take care of yourself? Um, we, we look at um, uh, um, anxiety and depression and nutritional status with albumin and white blood cell counts. And this is a score that's been worked out by other people who I don't know. Um, but it talks about, basically, it's called a geriatric vulnerability score. It's basically the health assessment of women who I think are 70 years or older, and this is a fair number of people who get ovarian cancer. And so the question was, what type of chemotherapy should they get? So we often think, this is a patient who might be a little bit sick, we're just gonna give them the carboplatin, we're not gonna give them the Taxol, because the two drugs together is a little more harsh than just one drug, and we think the platinum drug is the most important drug. And so this compared um, just the platinum versus the carbo and the platinum given in different combinations to see if one might be just as good but better tolerated. And much to our surprise, because this was done very commonly, uh, much to our surprise, which we'll get to in a second, uh, 40 patients were put into each of the arms. One thing to keep in mind, surgery was not part of this trial, but two-thirds of women either never had an operation or had an operation that was, quote, unsuccessful. So we do lots of operations. We want to take out all the cancer. We use all of our information to predict that we can take out all the cancer. But if we can't, and if we leave a lot of cancer behind, we actually haven't helped somebody. But since it's so important to try to do that, we do that for a lot of people. And in our hands here at NYU, about 80% of the time or more, we are able to take out all the cancer. We don't want to withhold a very useful operation from 80% of people, but we don't get it perfectly right. But in this study, only 7 to 10% of people had all the cancer taken out because they're already studying a group of people who are older, may not tolerate a big operation, et cetera. So, so there was not a lot of great surgery being done in this study, which is why people um, you know, were on this study to figure out the chemotherapy differences. And in fact, you know, 50 to 60% of people received all the chemotherapy, so that was great. But what we learned is that the single agent carboplatin was actually much worse. And so this was a common thing that people were doing. They were, they were, they were receiving single agent carboplatin because we thought, well, that's good enough, and it wasn't. And so ever since this came out just this past summer, we're now trying not to just give single agent carboplatin to anybody. And it also shows that people who are older and quote, vulnerable or kind of maybe a little bit frail, they can tolerate full doses of chemotherapy. And there's no reason to kind of cut back on the dose just because the doctor might be afraid this person's not gonna tolerate it. It just shows that people really can tolerate the chemotherapy that we give for ovarian cancer. And so everyone should get two drugs together, um, really, if at all possible. And this was a very, very important study. And because of this study, and because so few people actually had proper surgery and still did pretty good, we kind of questioned the role of surgery. And so this is a study that's being planned. It's not open. It's very controversial. We have some internal discussions going on with our national, national groups. And basically, the question is, and I won't read all this, but the question is, could you just have chemotherapy? and do just as well as getting chemo and surgery and chemo. So not for everybody, but if you, maybe you can't have that big operation, do you need an operation at all? Who wants an operation if you don't need an operation? And so this is basically saying, for people who are gonna get chemotherapy first, 
after the first three cycles of chemotherapy, there's a randomization to surgery versus no surgery. And then we see how people do. And so this is controversial because surgery is like a baseline or a hallmark of ovarian cancer, you know, and it's probably very important for many people, but there's probably some people where it's not helping that much. And so, so this study, I, I hope we can do it and, and, um, and, uh, and learn from that. Uh, so moving on, the um, sort of the exciting types of drugs you may have heard about if you're keeping up with the field are basically PARP inhibitors. And just to summarize, PARP inhibitors work very well for anyone with ovarian cancer who has a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. They're FDA approved for that reason, and we give that all the time to people who have BRCA1 or 2 mutations. Um, and they probably don't work so well on their own for people who don't have BRCA1 or 2 mutations. And so we're trying to make them work better by combining PARP inhibitors with other sorts of treatments. The other thing you've heard of is immunotherapy, or sometimes called checkpoint blockade. Um, immunotherapy does not work very well for ovarian cancer by itself. And we've just learned that. So if anyone's been on an immunotherapy trial, we didn't know that. But we now know now that for ovarian cancer, it doesn't work very well by itself. But when we combine it with other types of drugs, it works much better. And that's where all of our trials are going now. And so we're very excited about that. We have seen much more benefit when we combined it. We're not sure um, how, uh, how big of a benefit it is and how much we can push that benefit to make it work even better. And so that's where a lot of the studies are, are happening now. So this study was basically um, asking a very interesting question about uh, PARP inhibitors in women who do have BRCA mutation, uh, mutations whose cancer has come back. And the question is, if your cancers come back and you have a BRCA mutation, should you just get a PARP inhibitor, which is a pill, or should you get regular chemotherapy and get a PARP inhibitor later? Because we're so tied to chemotherapy for ovarian cancer, it's really hard to like not give chemotherapy when we can. And so this study um, enrolled uh, 250 women. This is called a one to two randomization. So there's twice as many people getting the investigational drug, the PARP inhibitor, as getting chemotherapy. So it's a two to one randomization. And what they found is that in the BRCA population, which I believe is over here. Yep. Uh, actually, I didn't show that here. But in the BRCA population, there was no benefit. Um, Forget that, this different study. Uh, so what they found is in the BRCA population, this is all BRCA carriers, in the BRCA population, the PARP inhibitor actually worked better than the chemotherapy. And so now, for people with recurrent disease who have a BRCA mutation, the option can be PARP inhibitor or chemotherapy, and we can figure out which one, which one to give first. And so that was a really um, important study. Um, and this slide I put in just to remind you that PARP inhibitor is a pill. Take it once a day or twice a day. That's really easy. You don't have to come in the office. But it's real chemotherapy. It's real chemotherapy in a pill form. And what you can see from this teal bar, is that nice? They made it teal. In that teal bar, you can see that 21% of people on the PARP inhibitor had grade 3 anemia, which is a type of anemia that can require a blood transfusion. So now we talk about getting a PARP inhibitor, like a maintenance therapy. And I always say, you know, do you want to take a PARP inhibitor? versus, you know, go lie out on the beach. You know, because if you're not at any treatment, you might go to the beach. If you're on a PARP inhibitor, maybe you go to the beach, but you're gonna be tired, a little nauseous, you might need a blood transfusion. It's well tolerated, and of course, if it works, we certainly wanna do that. Um, but they're real drugs that have real side effects, um, and 20% of the time there's, you know, real anemia that sometimes needs a blood transfusion. So, you know, it's just important for people to understand it really works, and it's a real drug. It's not just like I'm taking a Tylenol every day. Um, it is great that it works in a pill form, and, and, and it's, it's a big advance, and it's also great you know, that it works. Um, so that's the SOLO3 study. Um, let's see. There we go. So this, this is the, uh, the other study. So, so in recurrent cancer that's platinum-sensitive, this study is comparing just the PARP inhibitor versus a PARP inhibitor and what's called an anti-angiogenic inhibitor, or bevacizumab, which goes by the commercial name Avastin. Um, it's a, also a VEGF antibody, and it blocks the blood vessels. If you block the blood vessels, the tumor can't get nutrients, and then the cancer cells will die, and this works. And so in this study, the question is, 
If you have recurrent ovarian cancer, again, the question is we don't want to give regular chemotherapy. Can you just get a PARP inhibitor or can you get a PARP inhibitor with bevacizumab or the anti-angiogenic inhibitor and will that work just as well? And again, 40 or 50 people in each arm. And this is the fascinating point here. So this is what I was confused with the previous slide. In the BRCA population, because PARP inhibitors work so well in the BRCA population, adding that second drug didn't do anything. And we've seen this in a couple of trials. So if you have a BRCA-associated cancer, the PARP inhibitor works really well, you don't need something else. But in the non-BRCA population, adding the bevacizumab made a dramatic difference. And PARP inhibitors don't really work so well in the population of women who don't have a BRCA mutation. But when you add uh, bevacizumab to that, it works quite well. Um, and then I asked myself, I said, well, are you just seeing the effect of the bevacizumab? Because these people didn't get bevacizumab. But in fact, the bevacizumab, which also works, it actually works twice as well combined with a PARP inhibitor. So this is a nice option. It's two drugs that actually don't work that great on their own, but you put them together and they have what's called synergy. It's not just taking the effects of the two drugs and adding them, which would be additive. You actually get an improved benefit, which is called synergy, which is actually what we're looking for when we do these trials. I was explaining to you how you take some drug and you add another drug. We don't just want to put them all together because then we can give them separately. If we give them separately, we decrease the toxicity. If we give them together, we increase the toxicity, so it only makes sense to do that if you get more than what's called additive. So one plus one should equal three. If one plus one equals two, we should do one and then one and not together. But if one and one equals three, then we want to do that together. That's called synergy. Um, and so this is another option. This again shows you the same thing. The anemia in the dark red and blue bars, again about 20% with a PARP inhibitor, and high blood pressure when you give bevacizumab because it's known that when you target blood, blood vessels, which regulate your blood pressure, your blood pressure goes up. So if you've received bevacizumab, your blood pressure's probably gone up. We know people need blood pressure treatments. We have cardiologists who work with us because we are pretty good at managing blood pressure, and we're a lot better at managing blood pressure than we are at managing ovarian cancer. So we want to use the drugs that really target ovarian cancer and then deal with the blood pressure, which we can do. It's a pain, it's not easy, but we, but we can do that. Um, and so that's the conclusion of that study. This is another very exciting study of a drug called lenvatinib. You might have read about it yesterday because it was just FDA approved for endometrial cancer. Um, Lenvatinib also targets blood vessels and other things that make cancer grow. It's called a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, so it targets um, sort of different receptors that make uh, cancer cells active. And here, it's given with Taxol, which is a traditional chemotherapy agent. The question is, if you give Taxol plus minus this new drug, this is the classic trial. So giving Taxol is a very good chemotherapy agent. We give it to lots of people. Can we add something else to make it better? And here, this was a study of a couple of different um, types of cancers. Um, and waiting here. There we go. So this is the schema. Levatinib, like a lot of new drugs, is also a pill. It's real chemotherapy, real side effects, but it's a pill. That's better. Um, Taxol is Taxol given once a week. Um, 13, 19 patients had ovarian cancer. Only seven had endometrial cancer. So it's mostly an ovarian cancer study. Endometrial cancer studies were done previously, worked out very well, which is why we expanded it to um, why we expanded it to ovarian cancer. And what you can see is that people did get high blood pressure because this type of drug also can target blood vessels, and so there is high blood pressure. Um, this drug does give you diarrhea. In fact, the 8% diarrhea rate is kind of on a low side because this drug does have some diarrhea, which can be kind of a pain in the butt, so to speak. Um, thank you for laughing at my joke. Um, and it also can lower blood counts, et cetera. Um, but it works. And so this is called a waterfall plot. And basically, the top line is kind of baseline. And everything that's negative means tumors are getting smaller. And so this is really good. The red line at minus 30 is 30% shrinkage of tumor, which is kind of our uh, defined sort of success rate for, for whatever reason. That means the drug is kind of worthwhile. And you can see you know, it's worked, it works pretty well. And so we're excited about that. Um, the blue bars are ovarian cancer. The red bars are endometrial cancer, so mostly ovarian cancer. 70% uh, of people actually had a response, which is great. Um, and so this is safe and tolerable. Um, and this is lenvatinib with pembrolizumab. 
And so, so I'm, I'm sorry, Levant, and then with, with Taxol. And so there's other evidence that suggests when you combine it with immunotherapy, so that's called pembrolizumab is one of, of a couple types of, of, of immunotherapy. Um, so now we have an ongoing trial here, and only at a few other centers we're actually combining pembrolizumab with, with levatinib for ovarian cancer only after receiving three prior treatments for ovarian cancer. So it's for what we call fourth line therapy. So you've got three different regimens of chemotherapy and you still need something else, this is the trial for you and we are just starting to put a few people on, on this study, but it's for fourth line ovarian cancer therapy. The way clinical trials work, if this trial is positive, it'll go from fourth line to second line and then to first line as things start to get better and better. Um, so before I wrap up, I just want to mention one more thing about PARP inhibitors. Um, there's another major conference going on in Europe uh, next weekend it starts. And so PARP inhibitors have been tested sort of kind of all over the place. We use it a lot for people, again, with BRCA mutations. But the question is, can you combine it with chemotherapy for people who may or may not have BRCA mutations? And, and a, another PARP inhibitor called Viliparib, which is one of the least studied PARP inhibitors, uh, just finished its first upfront trial where it's given in combination with Taxol and Carbo, and there's a press release, so I'm not divulging anything secret, but there's a pre press release that came out a few weeks or months ago explaining that it was a positive trial. And so that's another big and exciting addition to our ability to treat ovarian cancer. It's possible that everyone will get a PARP inhibitor with Taxol and Carbo as initial treatment. What we have to see next weekend when the data are actually presented is how positive is it? Is it a statistically you know, significant trial, but the actual benefit is something that we don't care about? Or is it a huge drop the mic type of benefit where you know, it's, it's, it's really gonna make a difference? And when we see the numbers, we can sort of interpret it. We'll also learn about the toxicities, and then we can kind of learn about the balance and discuss it with, with people and say, you know, is this something that we should be doing? And so I, I don't know the answer, and, and we'll know that af after next weekend. Um, so this is an example of types of clinical trials we have here just for ovarian cancer. Uh, we have a neoadjuvant trial that is testing an immune modulating drug that we put directly into the belly, um, and that's going to be opening in the near future. Um, we finished a trial of, a, of immu immunotherapy uh, with chemotherapy. Uh, we now have an open trial for newly diagnosed patients that includes um, immunotherapy plus a PARP inhibitor. So again, we're trying to see how we can put these drugs together to make them work better and also make sure they're tolerable. So this is open now, PARP inhibitor, checkpoint inhibitor, immunotherapy, and chemotherapy. Um, and this is a maintenance study. So once you're done with regular chemotherapy, now instead of giving just a PARP inhibitor, we give a PARP inhibitor, again, with immunotherapy because the PARP inhibitor is a standard of care for women who have BRCA mutations, but if you don't, we need something better, and so we think the PARP with the immunotherapy um, is likely to be helpful. Uh, for a disease that's come back, um, if it's what's called platinum sensitive, which I think people are familiar with, we have a study of, again, a PARP inhibitor with immunotherapy, and we have a study of a PARP inhibitor in people whose tumors have a mutation that's not BRCA1 or 2, so it's one of those other types of mutations like RAD51C and D. It's not proven how well the PARP inhibitors work, and so this study is testing PARP inhibitors in those other genes where you can't actually get the PARP inhibitor through the FDA-approved indication, which is only for BRCA1 and 2, and so this trial is seeing how to expand the arena of PARP inhibitors to other women who have uh, alterations that we think should, should be useful. Uh, for what's called platinum, you know, when the, can when the cancer doesn't respond to platinum anymore, we need new uh, options. This is what I just talked about, levatinib plus Pembro for recurrent ovarian cancer. This is, again, a PARP inhibitor and another checkpoint inhibitor um, that's going to be opening soon. Uh, we have, again, sidirinib, which is like bevacizumab. It targets blood vessels. So, again, blood vessel plus a PARP inhibitor. Uh, we have a, a immunotherapy trial on hold. Uh, we have a really exciting... Uh, trial here. This is, um, this is an antibody that affects both blood vessel formation and immunotherapy all in one shot, and it affects the blood vessels in a really novel way. And so um, that's combined with Taxol um, in, in, in this trial here. And we have another trial that's on hold right now, but again, it's a checkpoint. It's a vaccine against, um, against um, not CA125, it's a vaccine um, Again, something I'm forgetting, obviously, um, and a DNA methyltransferase inhibitor. So this is something called um, this is this is a drug that 
that um, reactivates genes that are inactivated by something called methylation. Um, and this is, a, I think, a MUC1 uh, vaccine. It's a, they're all like these real complicated drugs that were all put in together. It's run out of Roswell Park, and that's very exciting. And let's see what's next here. And so to, uh, to wrap up, um, Chemotherapy combinations are showing great promise for both initial and recurrent cancers. Um, our progress is directly proportional to the success of clinical trials and the amount of funding we have for translational research. So if you or any of your friends have an extra $100 or an extra $100,000, please give them to my research laboratory, NYU, the National Cancer Society, the American Cancer Society, your favorite institution where your doctor or friends work. Um, we need to, you know, there's lots of funding for all the cancers that are more popular, like breast cancer and lung cancer. We need funding for ovarian cancer. Our progress is directly related to how much research funding we have. And you may not have an extra dollar to your name, but you might know somebody. So we need people to realize how much progress we're making and how important the research is. And we need all sorts of funding. Our governmental funding goes down all the time. And so any funding that we can get um, will, help, will, will help the cause. Um, and uh, lives can be saved through genetic testing and cancer prevention. Clinical trials are not always successful. We always learn. We learn what drugs to give, what drugs not to give, and it's very important for everyone to live longer and better. And all the standard treatments today, they were in a clinical trial at some point. Um, we have lots of clinical trials here at the Perlmutter Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, some of these slides I stole from people who gave presentations at national meetings, and we always want to thank all the patients who actually do go on clinical trials. We actually want 10% of our patients to go on clinical trials, and here we have 14% of our patients who do go on clinical trials, but that means most people don't. Why don't they? It's hard. It's hard for a patient to go on a clinical trial. It's hard for a doctor to put someone on a clinical trial. We have, a lot, we have paperwork anyway. We have a lot more paperwork when we do clinical trials, and it's hard for the institution to run clinical trials, and we lose money. I make a lot more money doing an operation than putting someone on a clinical trial, and I love both. But it's hard. clinical trials are tough, and so um, we have to do them because that's how we make things um, better. And this is my group that helps us do both surgery and clinical trials. Uh, this is our research lab over here. These are our doctors at our Manhattan campus. We have a hospital in Brooklyn. We have a hospital in Long Island, NYU Winthrop. This is our brand new hospital that's all single beds, only single bedded hospital in, in Manhattan, and the newest hospital in Manhattan. And so we have 13 G1 oncologists across the sort of small tri-state area, and we get a lot of support from other foundations to, to do a research. Church. Um, and that's it. Thank you for coming. And, and that's our hotline. If you need us, we have a we have a hotline right over there. All right. Questions at all? Covered everything? When you refer when you're talking to CRCA, does that include somatic as well as uh, germline? Right. So obviously for genetic testing, it's all germline, but for the treatment, it's the same. So we've learned that the PARP inhibitors, which I think what you might be talking about, the PARP inhibitors work just as well for BRCA, however it gets into the cancer, whether it's from germline or somatic, the PARP inhibitors work for any type of BRCA mutation that's in the tumor. Genetic testing, um, is the quality any better versus the blood? Testing the blood as opposed to the saliva, or should you have both done? I mean, I only had saliva. No, saliva and blood should be the same. You, you get more DNA out of blood, so you might give a saliva sample and might tell you it's not good enough. You may have to give another one. But once they have the DNA, it's, since it's a germline, it's in every cell of your body, whether it's your blood cell or your saliva really gives your, it's, it's really the inside of your cheek. You're really spitting out cheek cells when you give a saliva sample. And so it doesn't matter what cell it comes from, it's every cell in your body, just okay. as good. Can the mutation change, for instance, if you're tested at one point in your life, yeah. maybe 20 years later, can that right. change? So the inherited mutations can't change. What we know about the mutations can change. So the testing we would do 20 years ago wasn't as sensitive or as good as the testing we're doing now. So if you've been tested more than 10 years ago, you might want to consider more testing because we do have those other genes that we test now. If you've been tested five years or less, it's probably the same. And then five to 10, someone would have to look over the report to see what was done. If we look at the report, we can tell whether it's any different. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, so I know that there are different germline uh, 
besides BRCA, that genes, these genes mutations that, uh -huh. that would that you might end up with ovarian cancer. Um, are there any specific? I mean, I know about lynches and BRCA. Is there anything else that? Right, so it's mostly Lynch syndrome, which I didn't talk about, and what we call heredita hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, which is basically for ovarian cancer, the five known genes, BRCA1, BRCA2, RAD51C, RAD51D, BRIP1, maybe PALB2. What she mentioned is something called Lynch syndrome, which is a basically endometrial and colon cancer syndrome, but it also has ovarian cancer in it. And, those, and so the BRCA genes affect the way that uh, DNA is repaired through something called homologous recombination where pieces sort of come out and get glued back together. The other type of way that DNA can be repaired, one of many ways, is called mismatch repair where like something isn't read properly and there's a mismatch and these, these genes, proteins come in and fix that mismatch. And those are basically four genes called um, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. And there's another gene called EPCAM that's sort of related. And those can cause hereditary colon cancer and endometrial cancer and sometimes ovarian cancer. So those are covered on the panels. Um, they are more associated with endometrioid and clear cell ovarian cancers. They're not so much associated with high-grade serous ovarian cancer, but it is something that we do as a matter of routine. I just did not discuss it tonight, but you are correct. Okay. So Those are genes that can be associated with ovarian cancer. Right, so I have high-grade cancer, uh, and I only did the BR, I didn't have a panel. Right. right. So does it make sense to have a panel? So if you were tested many years ago, you would have, if you were tested five to ten years ago, they would have been saying, do you want a panel, do you not want a panel? So the panels are more comprehensive. So yes, um, regardless of what kind of cancer it was, because if it was high-grade serous, it's probably not for one of the Lynch genes. But if you only had BRCA1 and 2, you didn't have RAD51 C and D. I would say, um, so what I didn't tell you guys is about 15 to 20 percent of ovarian cancer is inherited. About three-quarters of that's from BRCA1 and 2. And so about, you know, maybe three to four percent is from the other genes and so you know that's substantial and so um, um, particularly if you have family members who could be at risk I would say you should go back for panel testing yeah. or something to consider. Yeah. Are any of those other cancers related to leukemia <coughs> by any chance or not? Uh, leukemia in this population can be related to getting chemotherapy just so you know. Chemotherapy does have a one percent chance of giving you leukemia. Um, those particular genes, so the BRCA1 and 2 genes can be related to other blood disorders called Fanconi's anemia, mm -hmm. um, which is not exactly leukemia. So I don't think they're directly related to leukemia as far as I'm aware. What about taking drugs to be a leukemia donor? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> other questions? <clears throat> is there such thing as chemo prevention? especially for genetic mutation carriers. Are there any studies looking into that? And the second question is, in families with BRCA genes 1 or 2, is anyone studying the non-affected members? Is there a higher inc incidence of cancer among them? So for non-affected members, there should not be any higher incidence than the general population. So what you're saying is if one sister has a BRCA mutation, she's at high risk. If one sister does not have a BRCA mutation, she's not at any higher genetic risk. There is still a familial risk, and this is more common in breast cancer. So in breast cancer, about 5 to 8 percent of breast cancer is BRCA type related, but there's also familial breast cancer, which could be from either other genes that I didn't mention or things we don't know. We think the familial ovarian cancer risk is much lower. Um, so I would say if two sisters, one has BRCA, one doesn't, I would say the one who doesn't, her risk of ovarian cancer is quite low. It's also a little unusual to have a strong family history. So if you have a strong family history and a mutation that tracks with the cancers, that family's risk is probably due to the mutation. If you have a lot of people with breast cancer and the family's tested negative, people still may be at increased risk of breast cancer. That's what we call sort of uninformative testing. If there's like three or four family members with early onset breast cancer, they've had genetic testing that's negative, the family is still at risk for breast cancer. If it's positive, it's informative, because that means the sister who has the mutation is at risk and the other one is not at risk. So I would say the answer basically is you're not at increased population risk. Your first question, chemo prevention. Chemo prevention. So 
Chemo really just means chemicals, right? And so for ovarian cancer, the chemo prevention that works is the birth control pill. So the birth control pill reduces the risk of ovarian cancer by 30 to 50 percent. That really is chemo prevention. Um, Tamoxifen is a chemo prevention drug that can be used for breast cancer. It doesn't prevent ovarian cancer, but for ovarian cancer, for someone who wants to do something and or doesn't want to have surgery, birth control pills are great. Um, they prevent breast ovarian cancer more than a possibly slight increase of breast cancer. But again, if you're a carrier, your risk of breast cancer is really high. You've got to be doing screening and MRIs and mammograms. And so to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer by 30 to 50 percent is probably a, a good balance. In regards to prevention, um, how does one get involved in any of the studies if they are BRCA1 positive and premenopausal? Right, so anyone who's BRCA1 positive and premenopausal should be seeing a G1 oncologist, at least for a consultation, just to kind of make a plan. Um, the studies are open to anyone who qualifies, which are the, some age ranges and things like that, but the WISP study um, is going to be um, closing maybe at the end of this year. We might have an extension. Uh, Magenta's online. It's open to the entire country, so you don't need to be anywhere except your living room with an internet connection to, to do Magenta, which is genetic testing. The WISP study is a study comparing surgical prophylaxis or surgical risk reduction. So if someone's interested in having some type of surgery and they came here, we would ask them to be part of the study. The study isn't actually studying the surgery. The surgery is routine care. The, the study is, is studying people's sort of uh, uh, quality of life, and it's basically involves surveys that come onto your iPhone uh, or your computer. Um, and so we have that here. It's open at the centers I showed. And then the study that we're going to open hopefully next summer will be open almost everywhere across the country. Once it opens, there'll be a big press release. Share is going to put it on their website a lot. Force is going to have it on their website. Uh, NCI is going to have it. So you're going to hear a lot. If you're in this community and you're here tonight, you're going to hear about that study when it's open, I promise you. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you. So for women of average risk, can you say something about prevention? Yes. So, so, for, so we have no screening yet for women at average risk. But for prevention, um, the things that really are in your control are basically taking birth control pills and being healthy, which means activity, proper weight, proper diet. The other thing that's kind of in your control is having children. I mean, I say that a little sort of jokingly. I mean, if you have more children, your risk of ovarian cancer goes down. People who come, by that time people come to see me, they're not really kind of, you know, deciding that. So, I mean, yes, it's in your control, but usually it's not something you're actively going to change. But uh, for, for, for daughters, you know, and, and younger sisters, taking birth control pill makes a lot of sense. And I don't pass any judgment on trying to tell people how many, you know, kids they should or shouldn't have. Um, I just heard recently that the IUD might prevent ovarian cancer. Yeah, that was an interesting study. It came out a couple days ago, maybe in British Journal of Cancer or something like that. Um, I was just at this conference this weekend where I had another study from a, from a group at Harvard who showed the opposite. So I'd really say the IUD um, ovarian cancer link is, is, is unclear. I don't think there's any risk, I don't think there's any thought that it increases ovarian cancer. That's good. It does decrease the risk of endometrial cancer. It's a great contraceptive approach. It's very safe nowadays. The ones from olden days gave infections, but the ones now are very safe. And so it's a really good product, and I give it to a lot of people. I use it to treat some endometrial cancers. So I don't think there's a danger. Does it prevent or reduce the risk of ovarian cancer? I'm not sure the data is really mixed. Yeah. Uh, does one go for uh, the BRCA uh, test? So you do a couple things. So if you're in the New York area, any of the major medical centers have a gen genetic counseling program. Um, that sounds like mine, but it's not. Um, <laughs> it's not if I put mine on mute. Um, so if you have a reason, so if you either have cancer or have a strong family history, any of the academic centers will be happy to see you. We have a genetics number. We can give it to you. You can call and make an appointment. If you're just average risk, most of us now are doing what, what is called group counseling, just to kind of give education and have testing. One controversy is whether every woman in the whole world should have testing because we're going to find some people at high risk and do things about that, and that's controversial. But if, there's a, if you're not at you know, low risk, any place will be happy to test. You also get to test online. So if you if you have any sort of family history, you can do the Magenta study. It's still open. You go online and register, and you spit in a cup, and they send it back and forth. But any any center will do testing. It's really easy in New York City. If you live in kind of a remote area, you have to go online to get it done. Does that make sense? Question. 
Um, hi. I, I might have not heard something that somebody said, but um, I had a question. If I'm not BRC, uh, BRCA. right, um, and my foundation testing came back with no genetic propensity, is there anything that's out there for preventative, for reoccurrence? I'm in remission right now. So remission. So high, uh, high grade serious. Yeah, basically that's called maintenance therapy. So we want right. to maintain the remission. Um, so for the BRCA carriers, we're using PARP inhibitors. We have studies going on. So one study I showed is that when people have just finished their initial treatment, we have a maintenance study of both immunotherapy and PARP therapy together to see if we'll keep, keep keep that away, but that's for people who basically, as someone's finishing up their treatment, we've discussed that and they kind of go right on to that. So if you've been in remission more than a few months, you wouldn't qualify for that study. Yeah, you're probably going to be out of that window. So again, I would just say um, lifestyle things. The one thing I didn't mention that people always find, I think, fascinating, um, if you have a good social support system and you're happy, your cancer will stay away. And so this was tested by a friend of mine, MD Anderson, in animals, and we actually can make the animals have a social support system, or we can isolate them. We can also make the animals happy or not. And so in the exact same, because we can, we can control everything in animals, and it's proven in animals that if you have a good social support system and you're happy or not depressed, your cancer stays away when we control for everything else. So you say, well, that's animals. So another colleague of mine did that in humans, where we can actually measure hormone levels of stress, and people who had lower stress hormone levels also had their cancer stay away longer. We can't control everything in humans. Maybe their stress levels were lower because their cancer was away, right? Maybe their stress levels were lower for reasons we don't know. And so it's not a perfectly controlled study, but the evidence would suggest that a good social support system and happiness will actually help help as much as possibly keep your cancer away. In general, maybe everyone should have a pet. A pet. Maybe they should. A mouse. <laughs> If, if I had genetic testing and I tested negative for BRCA, BRCA. Um, people say BRCA, BRCA, but it's really BRCA. Right. It's BRCA. Um, should my daughter still be tested? Uh, if like you cancer? have ovarian cancer and you're, if you're negative, you're negative. So if you're negative and you had proper testing, not done at one of those other companies we talked, but at a good company, and let's say you had the whole panel done. You know, you can decide whether you want to go back and have a panel. But if you're negative, you have nothing to pass down. So that's the beauty of genetic testing. If you have ovarian cancer and you're tested negative, you, all of your children are at population risk, which is 1%. So I see a lot of people who say, my mom had ovarian cancer, should I take my ovaries out? I say, no. We take a family history. We make sure the patient or somebody had genetic testing. But as I say, everyone with ovarian, almost everyone with ovarian cancer has a mother, sister, or daughter and they're not all at high risk, right? So um, I just saw someone whose mom was 40 years old with breast cancer, and that doesn't meet the qualifications for even genetic testing because only one person um, in some algorithm. So yeah, once you're negative, you're negative, and your kids can't inherit what you don't have. Okay, now if I'm in remission now for seven years, um, I just I did not have the panel done. At this point, should I have it? <coughs> Again, it's something to consider. Yes, there are some people who will pick up a mutation that could have been related to your cancer, and then your daughter would be tested for that and have a 50-50 chance. Until I'm tested, if it's better for you to be tested, if you were not available to be tested, then she would be tested. But if you, it's much better because you're informative. If you have a Rad 51C mutation, she can be tested exactly for that mutation, has a 50-50 chance. If we test you, we know you're negative then that's great. If you were not able to be tested and she was only tested and was negative, either you had a mutation she didn't inherit or you never had a mutation, we don't know. So testing the person who has the cancer is always better when that's possible. Okay. Thank you. I was going to say as a bracket to me able to inherit my mutation from my dad's side, there was a big right. history on the father of your daughter's right. side, right. like sisters and grandmothers and all that. That would be the, you know, exception if, if, but, but if, I'm not saying, but if yeah. the person has ovarian cancer, it's going to be in that person. So you, you know, the, your dad may not have had cancer, but the person who has cancer is the right one to test because then we know, like, we have a baseline. If you don't know, you can inherit it from mom or dad. That's absolutely true, but it's always better to test the person who has cancer. I was tested and uh, my BRCA1 uh, mutation is not shown to cause cancer. Should my daughter get tested? So it's called a VUS. Is that what you're talking about? A variant of uncertain significance? Is that what you mean? Right. So a VU, so, so we're really good at sequencing now because we've 
developed a lot of really cool technology that, that outpaces our knowledge. And so, you know, all of us, so, so um, one in every 300 of our nucleotides is different. So like you may have blue eyes, I might have hazel eyes, you know, these are all variations. And so you sequence, you find a lot of variations. The VUSs mean absolutely nothing. We completely ignore them, and our job, my job, is to tell other doctors to ignore them and not make people go crazy. So if you have a VUS, you just ignore it. When we do enough sequencing, we're going to find these things. When we go back years later and learn about their significance and can classify them, 90% of the time they get classified as what's called benign or unimportant. So most of those things that we say we don't really know, once we get enough data to know, they become negative. Sometimes they become positive. So what you can do is you can take your report and wherever you are testing, every year or two you can contact them and say, hey, any updates on my mutation? And they can say, oh, it's become benign. Oh, it, now it is important, which you'd want to know. Most of the time they'll say, we still don't have any more information. But most of these places, even the companies, you can call them and say, hey, could you check if there's any new information? I recommend people do that about every two years. Um, you know, most people don't, but it's certainly a reasonable thing to do. Um, how are we doing on time? We till seven? Yeah. Okay, good. I think there was one or two more questions. Yes. I would like to know what are the chances for a person with a colon vector cancer and metastasizing to deliver again the ovarian cancer? So um, colon cancer and ovarian cancer are unrelated except through Lynch syndrome. Mm -hmm. And so whoever the doctor is would, would decide whether the colon cancer could be familial and then, then that person may or may not have genetic testing. But typically, most colon cancers are not related to ovarian cancer. Going back to your first slide, I think you said that uh, most ovarian cancer is high-grade serous carcinoma. That's correct, high-grade serous. Then, uh, so I want to know if well, with the clinical trial data and so on that you talked about, uh, does that exclude carcinosarcoma or all those others you had listed? Each trial is different. Some excludes, mo many will exclude, some include. Um, carcinosarcoma is a very unique type that, again, for the trials, you just have to look at each trial. For how we treat the disease, we take, you know, what we know and, and interpret it as best as we think, you know, using our judgment. But the trials have specific, almost every trial will say carcinosarcomas are included or they're excluded. And more than, more than half the time they're excluded, which is unfortunate, um, but we do have a few, a few that are included. This, this um, lenvatinib trial of fourth line I was talking about, that does include carcinosarcoma. Some of the other, that one trial where I couldn't remember every type of drug, that includes carcinosarcoma. So we have some that include and some don't. All right, well thank you very much. I'll be around for a few minutes. I appreciate you coming. Happy palindrome day. Thank you. Welcome. You're welcome.